Good afternoon, everybody, uh, and thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Anthony Guida. I'm the president of Friends of Architecture Santa Fe. Friends' mission is to create productive dialogue about design and the built environment in Santa Fe towards a more vibrant, equitable, and sustainable future. On behalf of Friends, I welcome you to this afternoon's uh, uh, event. It's the first installment of Revisioning History. This is a new series of interactive discussions about the future of planning, preservation, housing, and sustainability in Santa Fe by way of better understanding our past. Uh, the first ha half of today's one hour session uh, will consist of an introduction to the series and a brief presentation uh, or brief presentations by our five esteemed panelists. During the second half of our session, I will moderate a discussion between the panel and our audience tonight. Um, and uh, although we're still socially distancing, our intent is for this to be as interactive and engaging as possible. So starting now and throughout tonight's session, you can submit questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom interface. Um, if your question is aimed at a particular panelist or, or panelists, please note that in your question. Uh, we'll use your questions to structure our conversation for the second half of, of the talk tonight. Um, if you have any difficulties whatsoever, uh, please submit, submit these through the chat button, not the Q&A button. Right now, I'm very pleased to introduce architect, preservationist, urban designer, and my brilliant friend, Gayla Bechtel. Uh, Gayla, is, Gayla is an officer of the Friends of Architecture Board uh, and the creator and program lead for Revisioning History. She's gonna tell you more about her vision for the program and introduce tonight's panelists. Take it away, Gayla. Thanks, Anthony. Um, hello, everyone. And let me just get my, okay, great. So a few years ago, I was cleaning out my archives and I came across the Santa Fe General Plan and some sketches that I did for it but also some housing studies done by the city of Santa Fe in the 90s and uh, the chair contented design guidelines and other studies like the design and preservation of Santa Fe. Around that same time, I saw the project Barrio Dinalco, a study done by Andrews University that showed how tremendous density could be inserted into the, whoa, into the parking lot surrounding the Para building. And thus began an internal dialogue about why decades later, we are still talking about lack of housing, preser preserving buildings as objects, but not the culture or the urban design that made them. Listening to the same arguments about not enough parking and too much density in whatever neighborhood was being discussed and hating urban sprawl, but continuing to legislate it and approve it at planning commission. I thought, is there anything in these old studies that I found that we can learn from? So if, don't make the same mistakes or maybe rediscover proposals that, that weren't implemented then but could be implemented now. I thought we should bring these studies and these reports out to the light and take a look. For instance, the downtown vision plan, never approved by city council, has some excellent ideas and implementation strategies and yet it sits on the shelf. As an urban designer, I know that decisions matter. 25 years ago, I helped plan the rail yard and I learned in that process citizen-based led planning can not only happen, but it shows results quickly. We had an approved plan in a year and a master plan in two years. The rail yard is and will be more vibrant as time goes on and has generated and will generate a great deal of money for the city. So I kept asking myself, why aren't we still doing this kind of planning? So I have designed projects and lived all over Santa Fe. I lived on the east side, outside of town, on the west side, along the Santa Fe River, and now I live in Midtown. So I feel like I know the town, I know the city pretty well. I have studied countless houses in the historic districts and also the Bruns Army Hospital and I was on the board of Tierra Contenta. I love the people and the built fabric of this town. Yet I was frustrated by a seeming lack of vision or political will. There's no long range, there, was, there has been no long range planning public discussion in years. And more and more the general plan, the only long range planning document we have, um, has to be changed for projects to go from the boards to reality and more and more conflicts happen. 
parcel by parcel decisions are being made by city councils, not according to a plan, but according to who or when or who packed the room. For instance, Cerritos Road got getting widened. Was that good? For whom? Not for the pedestrians, maybe for the flow of traffic, but to my observation, to the detriment of almost everything else. One hearing that I've been to, not about the Cerritos Road, but another project was filled with neighbors against the project. But the developers spent so much money before the hearing that they had to win at all costs. It created an environment of us versus them. Is this a good project for the neighborhood or was it for the city or only for the developers? Everyone had an opinion, but no conversation was possible with the emotions and the stakes so high. Neighborhoods have become effective in slowing development at the cost of trust in any form of public planning. So less and less true public conversations happen. And so I made a proposal to Friends of Architecture. Revisioning History is a program that will be an open dialogue about what good design, architecture, and planning can do for Santa Fe. It is called Revisioning History because we are looking backward in order to help us develop a collective vision for the future. To not repeat the efforts and mistakes already made, to recover good ideas and inform new ones. In future sessions, these reports, studies, and plans will serve as the pretext for deeper conversations about planning, preservation, housing, sustainability, and more topics as we continue on this journey. Good design and careful planning are the key to great neighborhoods that work and for more density and done well. Everyone should benefit from economic and land development while slowing or reversing climate change. We can be inclusive and diverse in our, preser in our preservation efforts and house and support the most vulnerable members of our community. To start this conversation, we have invited experts in their perspective planning, architecture, and design fields to talk to us about their work today and answer questions from attendees. First up is Robert Ennis. Rents, he's a partner in Rents Design and co-founder of Design Corps. Robert applies 25 years of experience to his design and communications practice and Robert is also helping us promote friends and we are grateful. Throughout his career, working with national and international brands, he has turned his local and regional focus on supporting leadership and collaboration among small businesses and tackling social impacts and systemic community challenges. Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight during these wacky and turbulent times. I want to talk about design in the broadest sense and some possibilities for the future. As Cheryl Heller begins her book, The Intergalactic Design Guide, with a piece of wisdom from the bicycling world, and as experienced cyclists may know, that while riding, you're going to be inclined to stare at the rock in the path, thinking that's the best way to avoid it. Don't. Look at the space beside it, no matter how narrow, because what you look at is where you will go. Design gives us the ability to project images in front of us, look between objects, choose our path, and work towards shared outcomes. But we have to recognize that ability. And as we can see from the past few months, the systems that have been designed haven't produced the outcome that we would hope for. As Buckminster Fuller talked of floating piano tops, this is not to say that the best way to design a life preserver is in the form of a piano top. We are clinging to a great many piano tops in accepting yesterday's way of solving problems. We can learn from history and seek alternatives around the rocks and roots in our way. Russian constructivists like Rotenko pushed individual expression into a collective vision, promoting a more egalitarian society. The ideals and works from the Bauhaus school and Swiss modernism positioned as Graphic design is a professional practice and provided massive support for corporate America. Designers like Paul Rand amplified and served corporate images and identities, but those designers distanced themselves from any personal expression or critique of ethical responsibility. I'm sure Paul Rand didn't foresee the outcome of Enron, and provocative logos and slogans can't hide the faults of promoting home equity loans and catastrophic lending practices. And as abuses became more egregious, designers learned to question, look behind the scenes, and fight back. 
Even in 1963, designers within the advertising industry began seeking alternatives to simply selling stomach powders and striped toothpaste. Critics began pointing out the gaps in the systems of progress and shed light upon bigger problems facing the world. Educators and leaders like Victor Popanek and his Critique of Modernism, first published in 1973, called upon designers to rethink their profession and orient, the need, orient to the needs and lives of ordinary people. Designers stopped wondering, what can corporations or government do for us? And began focusing on more integrated, community-driven solutions. Like the individuals you'll hear from next, there are designers, architects, and businesses seeking better pathways through the rocks. IDO brought human-centered design to the people who need it most. Frog Design introduced their collective action toolkit to aid communities and groups designing better futures. Designers revised and upgraded the 1963 First Things First manifesto. And there are architects creating platforms to drive positive change, challenge the status quo, and think wrong as a means of breaking free from prejudices and worn out paradigms. Designers and educators like Emily Pilliton, founder of the nonprofit Project H and Girls Garage, which provides free and low cost after school and summer programs in carpentry, welding, architecture, and activist art to a community of 200 girls per year. The Street Store, designed as an open source project, provides digital files and guidelines in order to support homeless communities. Begun in 2014, the Street Store has now hosted nearly 1,000 pop-ups in communities around the world. Design for Good looks for spaces between. Jeffrey Brown didn't aim to solve poverty. He just listened to people's needs. Opening their first store in 2004 in low-income Philadelphia, Pennsylvania neighborhood, the Brown Superstores now ranks top in the top 50 small grocery store chains. We have a chance to stop staring at rocks in the way. We can ask, what are the conditions, needs, people, and influences that can lead to a better place and better outcomes? How can we create with others, not just for them? How can we shift away from searching for solutions or ways to change things to building capacity and resourcefulness within people? We can do it with design for good because it's designed for people. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Carlos. Carlos Gamora is a senior land use planner at the city of Santa Fe and is working to create or to facilitate creative change in the built environment. He is focused on big and visible systems and transformative change in the areas of affordable housing, long-term infrastructure costs and effects of land use on sustainability, equity and the local businesses. We are so excited for Carlos to be joining us this afternoon. Here is Carlos, thank you. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, so my name is Carlos Gamora and I'm a senior planner working with the city. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, city land use planning and just as a, as a disclaimer, these are my own opinions and I'm not representing the city in any way right now. So land use planning is the design and regulation of the built environment. It establishes the canvas upon which the built environment is painted and it directly affects the function and dysfunction things like housing, transportation, community services, and the economy. Good planning tries to consider things like time. Where are we now and where are we going? How should places evolve over the next 20, 50, or even 100 years? Consider spatial context. Where are things located? What are they surrounded by? This is lots of maps. It, it looks at interdisciplinary perspectives like cultural preservation, economics, urban design, infrastructure, sustainability, and social justice. There's two main tangible tools of land use planning, which is uh, zoning laws and planning documents. Zoning was originally created to prevent the proximity between dangerous and unhealthy industrial uses and residential uses, but it has since expanded to limit housing and ensure aesthetic harmony. But we must recognize that order and harmony sometimes create stagnation and sterilization, 
where chaos and disharmony sometimes create better livability. Kind of like antibiotics, regulations can both prevent the unwanted development, but can equally prevent things like housing, creativity, beneficial social chaos, and small startup businesses. The second main tangible tool of land use planning is the development of planning documents. Um, recent examples that we have include the Highway Corridor Plan, um, the Southwest Master Plan, the West River Corridor Plan. Gail also mentioned things like the Downtown Master Plan, um, the Rail Yard Plan. Um, each of these documents uh, certifies and records an agreement among a limited group of participants. They focus on the process, the education, and the collaboration between different groups, and they help to empower communities. But empowering communities and developing understanding requires continuous engagement and conversation. A key point here is that land use planning is not about getting experts to engineer solutions. Herein lies both the key strength and the key challenge. Planning experts try to understand how things work but the real decisions come from the community and political representatives who best understand their own values. And so when we think about democratic community-based planning, it's critically important in deciding community issues, but there's also complications that we have to work through in order to get this right. The first one is politics. We make decisions based on politics, but politics relies on who is at the table and who has a voice. And because some voices are excluded and many voices are quieter, we tend to weaken the equitable power of democratic debate. Consider the fact that most of our workforce and most of the youth are missing from political and cultural discussions. The second challenge with community-based planning is spatial inequities. When we make decisions, a lot of times they're good for individual neighborhoods, but sometimes decisions that are good for neighborhoods can be poor for the city as a whole. As an example, we could think about um, neighbor, a neighborhood protesting a large housing development because it negatively impacts their neighborhood. But as a result, housing is instead um, built in other neighborhoods with less political power, or it becomes more difficult to build and, negatively, uh, and ends up negatively impacting the entire city. And the third challenge with community-based planning is the complexity of urban systems makes it difficult to empower communities to understand and solve planning problems. Um, as, as Gayla touched on, many, many communities can agree that affordable housing is a problem, but a lot of times they lack the resources, are unaware of, or are unwilling to commit to potential solutions. And putting the decisions in the hand of the community is important, but that in itself doesn't ensure that we get fair, equitable, or effective solutions. And so we must constantly be aware of and continuously discuss who is participating and who is excluded, how we are participating in making decisions, and also how we understand both community values and the complexities of the urban and environmental systems. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. I'm just so thrilled you're, um, you're here with us and um, I'm excited to uh, keep going in this in the series with you. Okay, next up we have Sean Evans. We're also very happy that he's here. Um, he is the principal in charge of the Santa Fe Office of the AOS Architects and has led planning and preservation projects for the Pueblos of Cochiti, Oke Owenge, Santa Domingo, and Zuni, as well as Eastern State Penitentiary, Los Poblanos Historic Inn, and the Palace of the Governors. He is currently overseeing the Siler Yard housing project in Santa Fe. And before Sean takes it away, um, I want to remind everyone that we do have a Q&A uh, box and we'd love to hear your questions. Okay, Sean, you're up. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gayla. Santa Fe has long struggled with design, preservation, and cultural identity. Its historic neighborhoods have been taken from those who constructed them. Its honest architecture has been commodified, and the built environment has been overregulated to secure the tourist gaze. 
we've reduced a deep cultural connection between environment, tradition, and construction to an appropriated aesthetic style. And we've often made a joke of it. I was excited about the Vladem, hopeful that it would demonstrate that contemporary design and historic preservation are not mutually exclusive. Yet the Vladem raised a critically important heritage tension. The arguments over height, view sheds, and aesthetics were revealed to me as inconsequential. Rather, it was the loss of the Gilberto Guzman mural that revealed significant pain and requires healing. The hurt was less about the specific mural and more about a continued cultural erasure. Historic preservation is not the sole source of Santa Fe's historic trauma, of course, but it has come to represent it. Santa Fe's style and its subsequent conservation is rooted in the appropriation of someone else's aesthetic and has resulted in mass gentrification. Our good intentions to preserve this place have resulted in displacement, pushing out the community with the deep cultural connection to these streets. Preservation as currently practiced here has ceased to be relevant to much of the community because we focused on the preservation of things, not culture. We focused on the tangible, not the intangible. As shown on this diagram of intangible heritage, architecture is just one physical manifestation of culture, but heritage is of course much broader. Heritage is not a product, but is rather a process by which we carry culture from the past into the future. Our Pueblo neighbors have long understood their heritage similarly. Buildings, language, food, dance, and song are inseparable. The Pueblos are engaged in a variety of strategies for conserving their heritage. Here, preservation takes many forms and can accommodate change without all the hand wringing. America's oldest places demonstrate that the period of significance is tomorrow. The city of Santa Fe has begun to recognize the heritage disconnect and commissioned the Culture Connects Cultural Plan completed in 2016. Esteban Raul Galvez and Creative Strategies 360 led a broad community consultation effort to generate recommendations for people, places, practices, and policies to better serve the culture of Santa Fe. Among its many ideas, the plan recognizes the need to elevate unique cultural identities, encourage ethical development, acknowledge historic trauma, and broaden preservation to consider the intangible through community participation. This work was recently expanded through a collaboration with Little Globe. Presente, Stories of Belonging and Displacement in Santa Fe, provides us with an extraordinary foundation on which we can build a revisioned preservation. We're not alone. Preservation is being re-examined across the nation. The National Trust now talks about preservation for people, and many cities are shifting attention to living heritage through socially inclusive practices and programs like legacy businesses. Presente included a short story on the plight of small grocers in Santa Fe, here documented in this hand-drawn map in Johnny's cash store on Camino Don Miguel, the only mom and pop grocer still in operation. Many of these places still exist as buildings, many as homes, as seen on the left, and others as other retail businesses. A few have recently closed and remain frozen, while only Johnny's remains in operation. So of 68 corner store locations documented in 1949, 24% have been demolished, shown in maroon, 32% are now residential, pink, and 27% are light green and remain some other retail. So we've preserved 63% of the physical heritage, but only one of these places continues as a place of intangible culture, exp cultural experience. We could map a dozen or more other types of intangible heritage, and I suspect we'd find similar results. Through our focus on restricting physical change, we've lost opportunities for people-centered preservation that is more about the present than the past. So where can we correct our course? I suggest we start in our very oldest place, the Camino Real, now known as Agua Fria Road. Far older than the Spanish, this now linear place has never ceased to change. This spur of El Camino Real terminates in the West Side Guadalupe district, which is the least gentrified historic district. How can we preserve the culture of this place? We do so by loosening up on buildings and learning from the colorful celebration of culture in Luis Montano Park, where landscape and buildings continue to evolve to meet contemporary needs. We do so by empowering community to take control from the experts. A different opportunity lies along this stretch. Three miles between St. Francis and Siler has not been historically designated and should not be. This part of town has hung on to traditional land use patterns, long lots oriented to the rivers and acequias, family compounds and small remnants of agriculture. Here, individuality is embraced over uniformity. 
The culture of this place seems in a healthier relationship to its form. How can this community be protected from gentrification in ways that elevate its values of tradition over foreign concepts of material integrity? What can we learn from the neighboring traditional historic community of Agua Fria, where cultural preservation remains well knitted with its place? But how is our Agua Fria road different? Let's do this right. Let's collaborate to find a way forward to community and cultural preservation that will not sell postcards, but a heritage that we can celebrate more deeply. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Sean. Um, really provocative, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about that in our preservation um, seminar. So please, you guys, question and answers. We're well, we'd love to hear from you um, while we're talking. So next up is Solange Serkis. She is a registered landscape architect in New Mexico and works to create more connective spaces that bring people together in both outdoor and indoor spaces. In her work as a landscape architect and developer, she focuses on respecting, reclaiming, and creating a habitat using a natural palette of materials. I present Solange Serkis. Thank you. Thank you. The process should be a healing path, not just a result. Heal the relationship with the site. Heal when rules and regulations, ordinance and inspections, any constraint should be an opportunity. Reach for a positive outcome. Grateful for the last almost 20 years, Gaila, going from Tierra Contenta until the Railyard. Let me share some of the opportunities we have and how much we learn for each project so much. Interaction, preserving places, the essential of any kind of action, the two-way effect, a win-win, city, people, connection, education, quality of life, narrative, let's keep it all on, let's keep connected. Interdisciplinary, collective actions. To provoke a more connected community, we had the opportunity to participate and preserve what the past culture has given us to reclaim, adapt, or repurpose. A Museo Cultural, Relier, back then in 2006, Design Week. Seed for confluence points. New and old paths shall meet. Let's encourage to get back to nature encounters and use them as a transportation, lines, trails, and sidewalks for all. Co-housing okay. Co community, yes. Any housing, no. Design housing, yes. Balancing privacy with activities and environmental work, of course. Developers, Please, pretty pictures, be responsible. Be responsible and don't give or promising the underserved what we cannot build. Create possibles, build it. Pride on belonging. Keep our craftsmanship alive. Open concept opportunities. And a puzzle on any smart growing urban fabric should prevail under the value engineers. New Mexico Finance Authority said it very well. We did a project that truly captured the history and the spirit of the place. And by getting the second place, getting finance, getting built, stay coach, serving underserves. Public spaces, I love to talk about our parks being part of a provoke uh, connectivity, develop those following a law Low impact, low impact development. Let's try to meet, let's try to protest all together. Let's grow as a community. Uh, the work on Luna was about preserving an urban iconic presence, vernacular aspect to reveal some identities to connect with the people, destinations. And for any designer and any developer, I really ask you to not let the value engineer delete the value of the project because that's what is being happening. The link, our favorite project, 
because it was the project who linked us to our destination, to our trailhead. When community needed to engage, we study abroad. We show local, regional, national, and international example to give courage and to give uh, support. The open shape and the vernacular greeting was a result. Follow us to see what our destination was. Historically, the rail, the rail yard received travelers, resources, commodities, and culture. Railroad and artists support each other during the journey. The trailhead design source continued this pattern of engaging cultural capital. capital. Multipurpose building, reuse, reclaim of material, create or be the pollinator of an area. But multimodal connection, we will keep running it until it happens. We want you bike, hope in a train or a bus, and walk and connect. The construction, the backstage, and the diverse and the sustain. We are happy to share with everybody this journey and show our backstage of revealing a building, the before and after. Live, work, and play, a dynamic landscape that cultivates delights and relationships, grading of patterns, connect, interact, design features. Come and visit us anytime. We have developed a proud, uh, the dream of a landscape architect, a landscape within a building, instead of a building with a landscape, but also we give uh, pride for anybody who wanna connect and develop an educational piece and ask to connect with a color plant seasonal interest chart. And maybe you can learn more about our semi-arid desert landscape. This really make us very happy. When these things happen means we did it. Do not develop this last square inch, but make a space for connecting. A uh, little peekaboo, what is going to happen? Uh, terraces will be ready. And our last phrase, living history as a movement and motivation to create, repurpose, connect, or keep existing. Great, Solange. Um, so many great concepts. Um, connecting over time, over landscape is so important. Thank you. And now we have Jonah Stafford, who in 2000 founded Need Based Inc., an award winning and nationally recognized firm focused on sustainable housing design. Jonah has an advanced knowledge of building systems with over a decade of successful passive house certified net zero projects. He is also the chief technical officer to Be Public, a benefit corporation providing prefabricated building components to the public, to builders and architects with the intention of promoting socially equitable housing. I'm so excited to invite Jonah to speak here. So Jonah, take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Gayla. Um, you know, uh, uh, sustainability is a pretty broad topic. And, um, you know, some of our previous uh, presenters have certainly touched on sustainability from a cultural um, and social uh, perspective. Um, my presentation is more focused on uh, the planet's perspective in terms of physical sustainability, uh, which is, um, largely understood to uh, be directly related to uh, basically carbon emissions and the cycle of carbon. Um, from uh, Our buildings represent pretty clearly 40% uh, of our total carbon emissions uh, 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 globally. Um, of that, roughly 10% uh, of that is through the manufacturing of, um, of building materials and then another 30% through uh, uh, occupational uh, carbon emissions, uh, just from energy use and uh, from the building. You know, one of the common sort of largely misunderstood approaches to mitigating that, uh, the carbon impacts 
uh, for a building was to simply add PV to to a roof, and it's uh, people. It's easy for us to achieve a, a site zero uh, building just by adding PV to it, and um, so it would render your HERS rating or a home energy rating uh, system, which is what common municipalities use to uh, to rate the sustainability of a project, where. You can see that you know we get an electrical bill every month and so forth and so we see it and so we we basically we, we sort of build what we measure and so we zero out our electrical bill but it's you know optimistically only having a 30 percent reduction in our total uh, carbon uh, impact for the buildings and um, you know one of the things that we've understood has been you know around for about 20 years uh, and it's um, is a far more successful approach to reducing the carbon footprint from the energy use or occupational energy use portion is to invest in uh, just uh, reduction purely so you're just using less primary source energy so you're burning less coal to generate less electricity you're just using less, so it's conservation. So um, you can see there's a significant greater advantage over uh, just energy conservation rather than trying to do site generation. And one thing that's important to note here too is that like you're a common HERS rating for a, a passive house or a house built up uh, passive house sort of standards is you know around 40. So uh, so again the HERS rating is not a good measurement of the environmental impact for a building. Um, sort of the next step of that that's uh, becoming far more sort of socially available and that uh, professionally um, we're being more and more aware of is that the huge potential of environmental impact that comes from our material choices and selections like um, moving away from uh, concrete and steel which have very high embodied values and using more um, cellulose insulation rather than fiberglass using just uh, small wood so it's, uh, engineered wood products instead of steel and so forth um, are because of the carbon sequestering potential of, um, of these natural products, we start to see actually that we're dipping down into a carbon neutral zone. Uh, and, um, and so again, though, that HERS rating isn't, you know, it's gonna be looking at energy and so forth. So it's not measuring that carbon footprint uh, of the product. And what you start seeing up here is this uh, top top graph we're starting so the materials still have an embodied value themselves but they're also but they're uh, sequestering uh, more carbon than uh, their manufacturing process requires um, sort of the next uh, big step and this goes into Carlos is in planning and zoning and uh, sewages around development is that multiple family higher density developments uh, really are the next step to reducing that environmental impact just uh, I mean not not just I mean not even in taking into account infrastructure uh, requirements or anything just the building itself um, and so uh, one thing though that these buildings are inherently more efficient uh, and they also require less materials uh, so it's uh, um, just again less is is better in that context um, so if we can sort of recap in all of these like we're moving from uh, sort of our standard right now of 52 pounds of co2 per square foot uh, is typically for an environment or a carbon footprint all the way down to 0.6 um, and this is using off-the-shelf materials. Like I said, this is cellulose instead of fiberglass. This is not uh, any uh, ridiculously unavailable. We're not having to build 50-story buildings out of straw bale or anything like that. Um, and again, so really what we should be focusing on is measuring our carbon uh, more than anything else. Uh, and, you know, this is, these are things that have been around for a long time, too. So thank you very much, Gail. Thank you. All right, Anthony, I think it's you. Okay. So uh, thank you. Wow. Um, thank you, Gayla. Thank you, Robert, Carlos, Sean, Solange, and Jonah for these incredibly insightful presentations. Um, uh, 
to the audience, you know, I, I imagine this is a this is like drinking from the fire hose. Um, there's a lot of information very quickly, um, and as Gala pointed out in the introduction to the series and 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 in explaining the vision for the series, um, we are going to do deeper dives on each one of these topics. So so really tonight is a we, we have these folks here to give us a, a kind of taste of, of what's to come. Um, and, uh, but, but tonight is also maybe an opportunity um, to understand maybe where these topics intersect, um, or that maybe that they're views of the same thing, um, and maybe all part of a vision uh, of a future Santa Fe. Um, we anticipate that even when we do a deeper dive into, let's say, planning or, or sustainability, that we'll be talking about these other topics because they are interrelated. So we'll see sustainability in the preservation session, housing and planning and so on. Um, I guess with that, with that, um, with that in mind, I'm, I'm gonna kick off with, with a question uh, for the panel uh, to get us going. And some folks have been submitting Q&A um, and please continue to do that. We're going to try to get to everybody, but we don't have an enormously long session tonight. Um, I just wanted to start with maybe this idea, this real high level idea about um, visions and manifestos, especially since um, these plans and documents underpin um, or are going to underpin our future conversations in, in the revisioning history series. Um, you know, we've all heard, we've heard from, from all of these speakers tonight individual manifestos uh, about an aspect of Santa Fe's built environment. Is it possible to have a collective one? Um, have we as a community ever had a collective vision, say in 1912, and was that good or bad or problematic? Um, what might the relationship be to these manifestos and visions to actual policy, to actual uh, uh, regulation? Um, what might go into a contemporary manifesto and need one, need we, do we have to write one? I'm gonna put that to the board, whoever wants to jump, or to our panel, whoever wants to jump on that, please do. I'll jump. Um, so I, I, I love the idea of, of manifestos. I think we have to recognize that we, the origin of, of Santa Fe is is a manifesto it's um and it's a problematic manifesto it's 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 a result of the the law the 1573 law of the indies um which was a manifesto about um cultural domination um and an expansion of of, uh, of the spanish crown um and the city was laid out the city was imaged uh to create an appearance of of strength and, and domination Obviously, we don't want to do that. And I, one of the things that I, I'm so interested in, um, kind of Carlos's take on on community planning. And I think one of the problems with preservation, in particular, is that it, it not only has it been standardized in the United States, um, it's been standardized around the globe, and we've we've really stomped out the ability of individual communities. And of course, in Santa Fe, there are probably a hundred communities. Um, why shouldn't they have the rights um, to determine their own preservation, their own housing, their own sustainability, their own planning, according to their own individual values? And so I love the idea of, of related, perhaps disconnected, overlapping manifestos. Um, what could be better? Anyone, anybody else want to tackle that one? I, I guess I would like to. And I would in. suggest to the board that they can turn on their their microphones uh, so we can do a kind of free flow of conversation. Um, I, I guess I would just like to jump in a, just for a, a short comment that <coughs> manifestos are really something to react against. That uh, they really become something. You know, you take a stand and then you say, "Is that the right thing?" And so. So having a manifesto, whether it's, I mean, 1573, I mean, I think, Sean, um, yeah, it's like, oh, power and domination, here we are. But uh, so you're right, we don't want to do that. But how can we use the, the idea of a manifesto 
such as, oh, we want to do, uh, we want to do affordable housing for everyone. Like that's a manifesto. Then how do we do that? So let's, as a, can we galvanize around that, meta, that kind of manifesto? So that's all I really wanted to say about that. Yeah, Gayla, I think you, I think you bring up a good point that um, creating manifestos doesn't have to be these large issues. It could be something like we want affordable housing. When we think about um, these kind of collective manifestos or visioning documents, whether that's the 99 uh, general plan, the laws of the Indies, um, the Southwest master plan, et cetera. Um, these are, um, sometimes these are, these are these huge visioning documents. Um, and those always necessarily are including and excluding certain types of people and um, uh, displaying and uh, 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 kind of hiding different types of voices. Um, something that Sean said, I thought uh, resonated with me talking about how they have to be related, sometimes disconnected, sometimes connected. I, I don't think there's ever really one answer on how this should be. If we create you know, small area plans or small manifestos, um, spatially small, then those don't cover the entire environment. Um, if we focus on individual issues, it doesn't cover the interconnection of those issues. Um, but also, if we only focus on the big picture, we lose the individual character of the neighborhoods. Um, if we only focus on, if we only try to understand the entire urban system, then we lose the details on the specific subjects. And so that's where I think it has to be, uh, it has to be and. It has to be the and, not just the but. It has to be multiple types of conversations, ground up and top down, um, decentralized and centralized, small and big, short term and long term, uh, with lots of different groups of people. Fantastic. And I would imagine changing over time. Right. That, that right. Right. What that vision is, it's it's up for revision as you know as time goes by. Well, you know, one thing that strikes me is uh, you were talking, Carlos, is that like the uh, like planning and architecture. I mean, uh, planning certainly is a relatively new profession, right? Like, what about focusing on empowering and education the people that are actually in those environments themselves? Like that. Uh, you know, in a lot of ways, we've uh, unempowered individuals from building their own homes or from doing their own planning and so forth, which are things that they're completely capable of doing if they felt empowered to do it. And so by the whole nature of, in, I was struck by the, like the, the context of your statement of like, it, it was very much that if we just need to come up with a good enough system and then we'll apply it and that that might be uh, part of it, part of the flaw right there that it's being applied and it's not coming from them um, it working focusing just on education uh, and the impacts for of, of certain decision making make uh, decisions that are made in a micro location, how they impact the greater location. Um, uh, it's, I, mean, I think it just, like people are pretty uh, disempowered and like these expertises have become very siloed too. I mean, so. Um, I'm gonna switch to the question. Can I say audience. something quick? Oh, I'm sorry, yes. No, on, it's okay, very, very quick. I think if we have, some collective thinking with a little bit of chaos, like Carlos say, that will be particularly fantastic. <laughs> it's like the yeast, right? right? It's like, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, we have 10 minutes left, so I'm gonna to switch to questions from the audience. I'm sorry for moving quickly. Um, question for the panel. Um, how do we ensure that future generations are bound to, or at least mindful of, the decisions and agreements that are made in planning documents? Are there ways to make the visions developed in these documents legally binding, or at least harder to dismiss in the future? What's the point of community participation and empowerment if it doesn't result in legitimate action towards equity and justice? Easy question. I, I would venture and say, do you want it to be challenged? That you want it to be a growing document? And so that like if, if uh, if it turns out that there, like that, it's that document is not serving the, the community, then it should be revisited. I, I think so, having something fixed is a very 
I mean, the metaphor of having something bend opposed to having something rigid and break. And some... Yeah, yeah, to build off of that, I mean, um, we've, we've done that. In the 50s, we did that. In the 70s, did we, we've done that. In the 90s, we've done that. That's what our land use code is. We create laws. Hypothetically, these laws, the, the laws that we have, the zoning laws that we have, um, they must be, in order to have legitimacy, they must be based in community values, which they are of the past. And they've been created and, and changed that they've become this kind of horrible force. I don't think anybody um, likes our land use code, but, but it's such a hard thing to work with. Um, if anyone has ever tried to like go through the different processes, staff and applicants and the neighborhoods alike, everyone is having a tremendous amount of difficulty with this. Um, and so, and so, so, so can we do it? Absolutely. We create, we create laws. Um, they become fixed, and and we work with those. And, and future generations are bound by that to some degree. Um, I, I'm not sure who asked that question, but I think that's a great question. We want to be able to project that kind of onto the future. Laws is a way to do that, but we have to be very careful about how we're applying those and how easy those things are to change. Um, something that happens though is, is we go through these, we go through all this time and energy trying to create these planning documents, but those are still somewhat insular documents. They're not actually transferring to people outside of that process. And in order for those to kind of continue on to future generations, it has to be kind of agreed upon by future generations, which means persuasion, which means having good data, good evidence, good value base, um, and being able to actually make those connections with uh, policy at the moment. I, mean, I think building code is the same. I mean, building code is based on precedent uh, uh, in the past, which is based on assumptions and different technologies. And, um, and, it's, uh, and it just tr like strives to, um, you know, it's code, like code is built with blood and money, right? That's what it makes sense. So, Okay, that's a great segue. Speaking of blood and money, um, we have a great question from Margaret Luciano. Can you speak to land ownership and the power that it affords for who it affords to those who define our city? Uh, as renters, there's a sense of powerlessness and a lack of voice in forming the community, um, despite having lived here longer than those buying and developing land and property. How do people without land and economic resources or the right education? participate and be heard. Well, I, I just have to, to, to say that I think it's, as the first part of my presentation was probably glitched out, it's a, it's a vision that we can project in front of ourselves. And, and that has to be a inclusive vision. Um, as Carlos mentioned, the, the entire process is participatory. And I think from a visual design perspective, we need to contribute to amplifying the voices and those visions that matter. And I think in Santa Fe, the affordable housing debate has been it's been a very long debate and I think it's, it's a matter of being, being inclusive and, and looking at, uh, you know, looking at navigating the code, looking at navigating preservation as, as Sean pointed out, um, and, and how, how we can elevate and amplify those, the voices that, that do need to be heard. Um, and as Jonah reiterated, it's a matter of increasing capacity within those community members. And I think that's, that's, our, that's our mission, that's our vision forward. Yeah, I, I agree with Robert. I think that, um, and this is from my experience with the rail yard, is you really have to find a way to deliberate with everyone that needs to be included. It's not just, it's not enough to just sort of hold it up and display it and say, okay, here it is. Let's call it public participation. 
it's really having deliberation with people that are uh, going to be impacted and to try to be inclusive. And um, again, at the rail yard, we not only um, had public meetings, but not everyone was comfortable coming to public meetings or couldn't. And so we also had kitchen meetings, you know, so we found people that knew the people that needed to be talked to. And um, we sat around their kitchen tables and talked about the rail yard. And so I feel um, that it's, and, and then we also educated people about how, like Robert was talking about, you really make the intention, you have the intention, you have the goal. But you're going to teach people how to affect change in their own neighborhood or the neighborhood maybe that they want to be in. I mean, I can imagine renters, so you're right, they're, they don't have a stake yet. And so, so what, what happens, you know, how do we talk about that? And that there's a way that, but we have to have the will, we have the political will to do it. And I, that's what's been missing from what I can see in the last couple of decades, for the most part, it's just been sort of hit or miss. So re related to this, I'm going to ask one final question to the board, and then we've got about three minutes left. So I want to, I want to close out after that. Um, sorry that this is so short. This is an engaging yeah. conversation. Um, uh, there's a note here from Mario Nuno Whelan. Uh, it says, this is cool. It's nice to hear from inspiring designers and planning. But will future sessions include community leaders, uh, neighborhood representatives, local multi-generational folks, um, and, and get their take or reaction to this revisioning history? Uh, will we include the Agua Fria folks, for example? And maybe, maybe we could we could highlight that, you know, we're an independent group, right? There are folks in, in, in design offices with the city and all of that. We're having an open conversation. Um, but, you know, where are we going to go with it? I think that's the, that's the question being asked here. I, I'm older than I look, I just want to say. So. Um, I guess I'd like to, to tackle that one. We're in the process of designing our series, and it could be that if this is really popular and really successful, um, we could start having more of those kinds of um, discussions. However, we are not the city of Santa Fe, and it's really what we're really hoping for is to influence how our city gets planned. I mean, the general plan is up for an update. Um, housing is, you know, it's going to be one of our subjects for sure, but it's also the subject of so many other um, things. I mean, I don't know, Sean, it's part of Siler Yard. I mean, I know you talked about or talked to a great deal of, of people. I know that the Midtown Campus, um, the uh, Santa Fe Art Institute is having a, a public process. And so there are lots of different ways to get involved, but I do think um, It's um, sort of the, the back to the sort of power and domination and trying to answer that question. Yes, you know, help us help, help, help us get the people that are affected by planning decisions to the table, I guess is really uh, what I'd like to, to request and anyone else that wants to tackle that one. And it's a great idea to mix up like this this group also with administrators like within our municipalities and decision makers too i think that's that's a great idea absolutely i mean i think it's that people that are coming from the you know really have the responsibility of the decision making right it's good so it's our responsibility to educate them as much as possible and their their responsibility to make decisions on that information that's good but i just want to say real quick Go ahead. I, I just wanted to say real quick. So, so hypothetically, you know, um, in some in some communities, you have a lot of resources. You have a lot of organizations that are working towards this. In Santa Fe, the city really hasn't had the resources to move forward with a lot of long-range planning activities. There are staff members. There's groups that want that, but we just simply don't really have the a lot of resources there. Um, so instead, it's been kind of disconnected and decentralized processes. Uh, a lot of organizations have been working on that, and that's 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 also a blessing as well. Is that different nonprofits have been trying to develop different voices and kind of elevate those different voices. And unfortunately, we're at the hour, and I want to be respectful to everybody's time. Um, this conversation, the good news is that this conversation is going to be continued. 
we didn't get to all the really incredible questions tonight, but please come again and, and, uh, and ask them at a future Revision in History uh, discussion. Um, I want to thank our brilliant panelists, Robert, Carlos, Sean, Solange, and Jonah. Um, I want to thank the Revisioning History team, Gala, Lisa, Roach, and Christy Scarpiti. Um, I want to thank Robert and Design Corps for collaborating with us and for the brilliant graphics that we saw tonight. A uh, special thank you to Lauren Tresp of Southwest Contemporary for the great article this week. Um, I want to thank all of our financial donors uh, to friends. Many of you are on this call. Um, especially Steve Oles and Craig Hoops. Um, and thank you, everybody. There were um, well over 70 people joining in uh, for the call, uh, which rivals our in-person events. So thank you for joining us and thank you for making this happen and being part of the discussion. Uh, the talk or the discussion continues on Thursday, June 25th with revisioning planning, which will be a longer session and more time for discussion and questions and answers. Uh, visit architecturesantafe.org uh, to learn more and to register for future Revisioning History events. You can also sign up for our newsletter to stay informed about other, other programs uh, that includes design charrettes, lectures and workshops, architecture tours, which we are about to launch online uh, in a super interesting way, and of course our hugely success, successful Pitch of Future program. That's hard to say. Um, uh, Please support us uh, either financially on our website or you can sign up to volunteer. Uh, it takes a lot of people to make these things happen. And thank you, everyone. Have a lovely evening. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Good you. night, everybody.